it's my pleasure today to introduce you to two superb practitioners of the short story form, uh, as well as other forms of writing. First of all, Tanya Farley is the author of two books, most recently, When Black Dogs Sing, her collection of stories, and also a novel, The Girl Behind the Lions. Tanya is the winner of the Kate O'Brien Award 2017, and her stories have been widely published and have won prizes and been shortlisted in numerous competitions. She also holds a PhD in creative and critical writing at Bangor uh, University, Wales, and a new novel, which hopefully we'll get a chance to ask you about later on, is forthcoming from Harper Collins Press in April 2018. Sean O'Reilly is the author of, I think, five books, uh, a story collection titled Curfew and Other Stories, three novels, Love and Sleep, The Swing of Things, and Watermark. And with the Stinging Fly Press, Sean has just published his latest book, uh, another collection of stories titled Levitation. So please give a very warm welcome to Tanya Farley and Sean O'Reilly. Rob said I'm going to read from the short story section when Black Dog Sing and coincidentally it will be a year old tomorrow so it's its anniversary so it's really nice to be here reading from the book at Cork Short Story Festival. Uh, before I start I'd actually like to say thanks very much to Patrick Cotter and to Jen for having me down. Um, rather than read one story today I'm actually going to read three short extracts um, from different stories in the book. So I'll give a very short introduction to each one. Um, I'll read from the title story When Black Dogs Sing and it's from the point of view of a mother whose teenage son went missing um, in the early hours of the evening on his way to a friend's house. It's set in a rural area, um, which in my head was up around the Blessington Lakes in County Wicklow. And um, Carla, the mum, is divorced from Ray, the husband, and he's just returned to try and help to investigate the son's disappearance. Any news? Ray asks. He sits opposite her pours tea into her mug and then his own. She shakes her head and looks away so that he doesn't see the fear in her eyes. She knows it has been there lately. She's seen it as she stood in front of the mirror undressing for bed, trying to block out the voices telling her that Lucas might never come home. Ray sighs, lifts the mug to his lips and drinks loudly. For a short time they sit in silence, each one afraid to voice their fears. When he arrived three weeks before, they had sat at this table and she had told him everything she could about the last time that she had seen their son. He'd made suggestions, the two of them carrying out their own investigation that always led to the same place, nowhere. Have you been up at the Reynolds place? Ray puts his mug down and looks straight at her. I've been outside, checking on the dogs. You know you can't keep doing this, Carla. I'm not doing anything, she says, but she doesn't look at him when she speaks. Tom Reynolds told me that you've been going up there, that he's seen you standing outside the house at night. She says nothing. He says it'll have to stop, that he doesn't know anything about Lucas. He didn't just disappear, Ray. Her voice trembles. You can't go accusing innocent people. Why not, she says. He sighs, exasperated, and a small rational part of her knows that there is some truth in what he's saying, that she has no idea what has happened to their son. He felt bad telling me. He said he can't imagine what we must be going through, but you can't go prying into other people's lives, Carla. She looks at the ground. You must think I'm crazy. She says, no. Ray stands up and rinses his mug at the sink. He pauses as he walks past, squeezes her shoulder and she almost puts a hand up to touch his. She raises it a little and then lets it fall in her lap again. Upstairs, Carla hears him bumping around in Lucas's room. She imagines him getting undressed, sitting on the edge of the bed, looking around at his son's things and knowing that he doesn't belong there. She pictures him spinning the globe on Lucas's desk, 
jabbing it with his finger and wondering where on this earth his son could be. Carla sits there and drains the last of her tea. She glances in the bottom of the cup where the tea leaves are scattered in an uneven pattern. Her grandmother used to read these. She remembers women coming to the house in the hope of uncovering their fortunes. She never believed in such things, still doesn't. She doesn't believe that some gypsy woman can reveal the whereabouts of her son, but she's almost desperate enough to try. Overhead, the bumping gives way to silence. Ray has gone to bed. She stands up slowly, rinses the mug and hangs it on the wooden stand. She takes the black dog's lead from a drawer and he rises, knowing that it's time. So that's just a short extract from the title story. Um, the next story that I'm going to read from, it's called The Silence of Space. Um, it begins with a lady on her way to the train station in the morning, rushing to work, as you do, having eaten half your breakfast. And she sees a homeless man begging for money in a laneway near the train station. And she rushes past him, she doesn't stop to give him anything. And it's only when she gets on the train that she starts to think, God, he may have been somebody that she was at school with, an old friend. He really reminded her and he had a very distinctive voice. So uh, the extract that I'm going to read goes back into a memory of the time that she met this guy, Donald Mack, at school. And uh, he'd arrived in their secondary school, which is in a, a suburb um, in West Dublin. But he tells her that he'd lived in Kalini previously. And she, in this part, she's asking him, you know, why did the family move home? So... We followed a set of steps down to the beach. It was low tide, but there was a wind, and a couple of guys were out in the bay with surfboards. It reminded me of one of those Australian soaps, except not as warm. So I tried to button my skimpy denim jacket against the wind and tug the hair that was blowing in my face at the same time. Roscoe, Roscoe's a dog, by the way. Roscoe ran happily in front, smelling the seaweed and sea life washed up on the strand, oblivious to us. That's it, do you see? That terracotta house. Can't see much of it, I suppose, from here. Donald pointed upwards, and I shaded my eyes with one hand and followed his pointing finger. The house was high up on the road we'd descended from, down all those steps. There was a garden too, palm trees swaying behind the rocky wall and what I imagined to be the back of the bungalow. Why did you move? I asked. We were walking now, leaving the house behind. There were families on the beach, small children running around, fascinated and terrified of the water. They ran to the edge and squealed when a small wave washed over their feet. Donna looked serious now. The old man drank the roof from over our heads. He had his own business, the house, everything. The business got into trouble, he remortgaged the house to try to dig it out. But the problem wasn't business, it was him pissing it all away. Now he's supposedly on the dry. Donald grunted at this, disbelieving. It's only a matter of time, of course. And then I'll go home to find my mother crying, things smashed up, people. Donald picked up a bit of stick and threw it for the dog. I swear, I'll never drink. Not when I see what it's done to him, to all of us. How old is your brother? Twelve. I never see him around the house. Remy has Asperger's. He doesn't really mix with other kids. He likes numbers and things, facts. He has an uncanny ability to memorise them. Mam has a set routine for him. Anything that goes against it really upsets him, like the old man's drinking, but then that would upset anyone. I was distracted by the closeness of Donald's hand, which occasionally brushed mine. I itched to take it, to feel his big fingers close around mine, but I didn't dare. My parents separated when I was three, I said. Yeah? He stopped walking to take off his glasses, lifting the corner of his t-shirt to clean the lenses. His eyes were the deepest blue, lashes dark as night. He'd already started shaving and a few black hairs stippled his jaw where he'd missed them with the razor. What happened? I turned my gaze to the moiling sea. Same thing, drink. My mother didn't want me growing up in that environment, so she got him out. I don't remember much about him. Where is he now? Dead. Hit by a car walking in the middle of the N81 at three in the morning. Jesus. Yeah. I suppose it is tragic. 
but it didn't affect me, not really. He may as well have been a stranger. Roscoe had stopped ahead. He waited now for us to catch him up. He chewed the stick into pieces. Donal kneeled to pet him. The dog put his paws against his chest, making him lose his balance, and the two of them tumbled into the sand. I met Remy a few days after that. One of the bedroom doors was ajar. Passing it on my way to the bathroom, I heard a voice. A million earths can fit inside the sun. I paused in the landing, not sure whether he was talking to me or if maybe there was someone in the room. When I looked up, he was sitting on the edge of the bed, a book in his hand, looking directly at me. He bore a strong resemblance to Donal. I wasn't sure whether I should go in or not. I stopped at the door and looked in. You must be Remy. Neutron stars can spin at a rate of 600 rotations per second. Wow, I didn't know that. What are you reading? Slowly I entered the room. Remy didn't look up. He showed me a picture, a vast sky filled with millions of tiny blue and orange dots of cloudy masses of constellations. I sat on the bed and peered at it. Remy didn't react. Space is completely silent. There's no medium for sound waves to travel through. He didn't look at me when he said it, and I wondered if Remy liked the thought of living in a silent, uninhabited space where he wasn't obliged to communicate with anyone. So, gets darker, by the way. Um, it was interesting, I was here yesterday at several very, very impressive events, and one of them was uh, Nubla O'Connor and Tanya Hirschman, who were both here. Hi, ladies. <laughs> so, you were talking about the fact that a lot of the stories in your collections are very dark. Certainly, mine would be likewise. I don't know if it's something about Irish writers that it's something instilled in us, but uh, I think everybody likes good tragedy, really, don't they? Um, nobody ever wants to, to read a happy story. We all want to go, oh my God, that's awful. Um, but just to lighten things up a bit, that's why I'm saying this, um, this is probably, maybe, hopefully, the most humorous story in the collection that I'm about to switch to. So a different tone altogether. Um, this one is about, uh, well, four friends, and they basically have been dabbling a bit in internet dating. And um, again, actually, it's humorous, but it does take a dark twist if you stick with it. So buy the book, plug, plug. Um, so it begins, let's see, which part? Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, I'll give you the opening. So you'll never guess what. Probably not, I say as I lounge back in a beanbag in Accents Cafe. It's our new hangout since Izzy did an improv show here. Personally, I don't care for the basement of anywhere, no matter how hip and funky. I like windows, big windows, where my mind can drift up and out, drawn by the world outside. Pablo's in plenty of fish again. Mel sits back, eyes narrowed. Three faces turn towards mine, waiting for my reaction. Nothing to stop him, is there? I say. It is three months ago since we split up. Pablo. Or Paul, to be exact. Mel had called him Pablo from the start. If she hadn't, none of it would have happened. Do you mean to say you're over him? She asks, arching one burgundy-tinted brow. I shrug. He's entitled to do what he likes, isn't he? None of my business anymore. I'm about to add, sure he could even date you, Mel but that would be throwing oil on the blaze. It's better to let her think I'm over it, over the whole freaking fiasco. Only Anya knows how much I'm not over it. She comes to the rescue now by steering the conversation on a different course. How's the eBay business going, Mel? Mel shakes her head. Ah, I've packed it in. Nothing was shifting. I meant to say, actually, I've a load of clothes in the apartment, Izzy. You should come over and have a look. They're big sizes, 18. Izzy looks up from her iPhone. What? Do you think I'm an 18? Seriously? Mel shrugs. What's wrong with 18? Sure, I'm a 16, depending on the store. It's called ample cleavage. Nothing to be ashamed of, she smirks. Izzy stands. Well, I'll tell you what you can do, Mel. You can stick your size 18 up your cappuccino. The waitress appears at my elbow as Izzy storms in the direction of the toilets, phone in hand. Jesus, Mel says, what's eating her? Pablo, Paul. He said he'd never go back on that site, no matter what happened. But then, it wasn't exactly a surprise. People said all sorts of things they didn't mean, and he hadn't turned out to be the exception. 
Didn't think you were going back on that site either, Mel, I say. Didn't you say it was full of perverts and losers? Mel grins. The first I've learned to live with, she says. Sometimes certain needs prevail. Have you been on any dates recently? Anya asks, reaching for her chai latte. She's into herbal everything since she returned from her trip to India. She's even had her nose pierced, a tiny diamond that twinkles each time she turns her head. Not sure I'd call them dates exactly, but there's this chef has been over to my place a couple of times. Oh yeah? Are you going out? Mel leans in, conspiratorially, plum coloured fringe, newly dyed, falling in her eyes. We don't go out, Anya, she says. We stay in. Here, wait till I show you his pic. You've got to see this. She rummages in her oversized bag for her phone, thumbs an app and hands the phone to Anya. Jesus Christ, Anya says. Are you serious, Mel? She hands the phone to me. Mel spreads her hands dramatically. Behold, the naked chef, she says. A selfie. Phone in his hand, taken in his bathroom. I can see white tiles and a blue shower curtain behind him, but the background isn't exactly the focal point. The chef is ripped, a solid six pack a la Matthew McConaughey, biceps swollen, skin tanned. The picture borders on the pornographic, a tight pair of navy CK shorts pulled low over his groin. The face, well, the face isn't great. Pinning hair, a beaked nose, eyes set too close together. At that moment, Izzy returns and leans in over my shoulder to see what all the hysteria is about. Who's the prawn, she says. I can't hold in the laughter. Prawn, I repeat. Yeah, great body, pity about the head. <laughs> Mel stands and snatches the phone back. Where's he from, I ask. Cabra. Jesus, figured he was from South America. Where did he get a colour like that, this cabra chef? He must spend his, all his time in a tanning boot. I sip at my coffee and pretend to be interested in Mel's sex life, but all I can think of is Paul back on that site, back looking. I'm going to skip ahead a tiny bit just to the next time the girls meet up. Where have you been? We were about to give up. Working. Mel grins and holds out her paint-stained hands, palms up. Oh yeah, what are you working on? Anya asks. She's wearing a long multicoloured dress, silver bangles rattle on her arm. Jamie? The pro... Izzy stops. Your man, she says, from the dating site. Yeah, he agreed to pose to me. Quid pro quo, he said. Jesus, you'd want to see him. Mel flops down on the beanbag next to me. What do you mean, quid pro quo? She glances round, makes sure no one's in earshot, and then says, In turn, I let him take some pictures of me. A gasp from Anya. No. Mel shrugs. Why not? Why not? He could do anything with the mail. Blackmail. Anything. What if he decided to upload them? Don't be daft, she says. But her face has coloured. Besides, I have... What? A painting? Should that could be anyone. That's, that's art. So is photography, Anya says. Photography is art. Thank you, Anya, Mel mutters. I can see we've set her on edge. In all her blind vanity, she's clearly overed up the threat. The fact that she was now in the chef's power. Maybe you could get them back. Anya suggests. Wouldn't do any good, he'd have backups, I say. Jesus, would you stop? You're really freaking me out. Mel takes out her cigarette papers. Why was I so fucking stupid? Izzy goes to answer, but I give her a look that leaves her open-mouthed but silent. I sip my tea and contemplate. Have you been to his place? I ask. Yeah, Tuesday night. It's some kip, she says. Bed sitting at mines, has a loft instead of a bedroom. He lives alone then? Yeah, it's one of those big houses divided into self-contained flats. Why, she asks, curious. Maybe we could get them back, the pictures. They're bound to be on his computer, right? I never manage that. How would I get it out of there without him seeing me? I grin. He wouldn't be there, would he? We'd go over when he was working. He's a chef, isn't he? They work till crazy hours of the night. Mel is starting to like this plan. I see it in the way her eyes have widened. She looks around. Are you saying we break in? Oh, that's kind of a crude way of putting it, I say. Anya looks horrified. I'm not involved in this, she says. Diamond stood twinkling as she shakes her head vigorously. Of course not. All we need is the two of us. Thank you.
that one by saying, you know, let, let's uh, have a lighter moment because, as I recall, a couple of pages later, that one gets fairly pitch dark. It gets pitch darker, yeah. actually, as you go along. Yeah, and the ending in particular becomes. Uh, yeah, well, that's not the end. Something, oh, yeah, yeah. something, something terrible something happens. Something happens. Something they, happens. They go on their adventure. Yeah. 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 Um, but okay, let's not give it away. <laughs> and so, as uh, I think in this collection, you're very, you're not afraid to very much to imagine yourself into, um, let's say, diverse uh, variety of characters. You mm. know, not not particularly people who are just like yourself. There's all manner of ages and genders and so on. Probably one of my favourite was the one about the fifty year old man um, who is in a kind of melancholic state of his life, but I'm assuming you're a keen observer of people's interactions and social life and so on. What I want to know is, what is the spark? When do you know you have the, the, the pulse for a story? Mm, it's, a, it's a good question, yeah. I mean, again, I, I've listened to other writers saying that they never plan a story, and I definitely never plan a story. You know, everybody works in different ways, but for me, I generally start with an image. Um, and that's how the character will come as well, you know. Um, I'm very much a perfectionist when I'm writing short stories. I keep redrafting as I go. So say when I write the first paragraph, I won't actually leave that paragraph until I'm happy that it's as good as I can get it. So generally when I get to the end of the story, it's usually a finished draft, yeah. you know. And what, what was the image, for example, with the title story, the first time? <laughs> I really, yeah, it's, it's hard to know, actually, when you think back, you know, I'm, yeah, not, sure. I'm not sure what the, the spark was. I mean, and I suppose I had this idea of, of the four girls in the cafe, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to know what it was originally. Yeah. Okay, and Sean, how about you? When is it in a when, when do you know that you've got the the impulse or the, the pulse, the, the the motivation for a story? Generally, somebody tells you the story, right. and you then transcribe more or less. Nice. <laughs> Most stories are told. Yeah. yeah. So these, are you telling us that this is pretty much transcribed? A lot, a lot, a lot of those stories, bits and pieces, have been, been told, and that will always be the beginning. Yeah. To hear it live. Yeah. It means it's real. Yeah. Okay. And would you say the same for your longer fiction as well? Has it been kind of composed of snatches and anecdotes and stories that you've heard here and there? A lot of, uh, a lot of yeah, yeah. I'm surprised, even a bit shocked. <laughs> I have no imagination. <laughs> okay. uh, revelations are plenty. Um, okay, okay. Uh, another thing I guess that these two collections have in common is that they both seem to have had uh, a fairly long kind of gestation period. I was looking at the back of when Black Dog Sing and there are, there's talk of um, award nominations and shortlistings and so on, you have gone all the way back to 2002. Now, I'm not sure if there are stories in the book, but there are others, 2007 and so on. Basically, it seems like it's been uh, compiled over a long period of time. Is that the case? It's my greatest hits album, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why I usually refer to it when people ask me. And, and people do, you know, they always ask you how long did it take you to write the book? Yeah. And you're right, uh, Rob, you know, some of the stories in there, they are from 2002. Some of them are from just a few months before it was published. So it literally just took me that long to get published. Yeah. You know, it's not easy. Um, I, just, I haven't made too many attempts, to be honest with you. I know in the earlier days, I'd sent off some stories to publishers and uh, nothing happened. I remember I got letters back at that time. I mean, we are talking, you know, 13, 14 years ago probably, when there was no market for short stories and no publisher wanted to touch a short story collection. Um, so, yeah, I big thanks to Alan Haynes who, who did take the risk on it, you know. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm actually very glad though that it didn't happen earlier because I think it would have been a weaker collection. Like, I, I do think the writing has developed over that period of time, so... Yeah, yeah. You know. And were there many stories that didn't make the cut? You know, did you did you begin to form it as a collection at a certain point, rather um, than writing kind of discrete individual stories? No, there were always individual stories, really. I mean, obviously I wanted a collection published, and yeah, there were a few that didn't make it, that I looked over and thought, okay, there's, you know, there's no point in putting them in just to make up the numbers, really, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's quite a hefty collection as well. Yeah, you know? yeah, there were, there were about 20 in it. Or yeah. 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 And uh, in a similar way, a similar question, Sean, I, the, the, the structure of levitation interests me in that it, it almost reads to me as if it could have gone either way. If you know, 
you kind of squint your eyes a bit, you can see how that book could be a novel, in that you use this kind of narrative device of having many of the stories based around a particular location, namely uh, Cable Street, a, a barber shop on Cable Street. And was that something, were you structuring it as you were going, or were they stories that were written individually that then at some point you decided, okay, I'm going to put them into a collection? What was your... Well, it's hard to say. There are a couple of different things. I mean, um, I, I suppose I've been really concerned to be questioning what the realist ideas of what a novel was. For example, a barbershop is mentioned on Cable Street, but it's not the same barbershop, right. and it's not the same people work, working in it. It's more, it's more like if you were having a dream, a recurrent dream, yeah. it seems to keep happening in a barbershop. Yeah. Yeah. And that's as near as you can get to it. Um, the novel will offer, the realist novel will push you into it being the real place. Yeah. It's also like, um, you know, in dreams where you can meet someone who is, you know, a 37 year old man in, in the dream, but you know it's a 45 year old woman and you, you know it's that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the identities are yeah, shifting, all, places are shifting. I wanted all that to remain really loose. Yeah, and yeah. interesting, you talk about kind of questioning the, the, the realist on the pinnacle yeah. of fiction. So in some of these stories, more than others, you really rage against that, you really attack it from all manner of kind of different, at times quite disorientating, exhilarating angles. Well it is a bit of a consensus just isn't it? The realist, yeah. the realist consensus, yeah yeah. yeah. And uh, another question about gestation period, I hope you won't take this the long way, but, uh, the wrong way, but it has been quite a while, I think 10 or 11 years since um, Watermark, your last book also. With yeah, this, this book is not just dating for 10 or 11 years. Right, it's, it's more recent. It's the last few years. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and what, 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 what did you do in the intervening years? Were you just... Having a good time. Getting out of the house one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you put your pen down, so to speak? No. Nah. Right, so, yeah. He was researching. Researching, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but speaking of watermark, uh, you, you're both not confined to the short story form, you're both, uh, you're both, well, you're both novelists, I, you have a new novel Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, and you've written in several, do you feel, which do you feel most at home in, at home in, long form fiction, or the shorter form, or what's showing up better yourself? You carry your home in your back, uh, being at home in something is, uh, means some kind of permanence. I mean, I, I would be trying to keep moving. Right, um, every book is its own adventure. Trying to do something yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I feel, I mean, I suppose if you ever feel comfortable, I would say I feel equally comfortable in both forms. Um, I really love writing short stories, I'm very passionate about it. And I, I am the sort of person, I don't like to juggle and move between things. When I'm working on something, I'm very, very fixed on that project. So, for example, now I'm, I'm writing a novel, uh, almost finished it, um, the deadline event in November, so, you know, let's <laughs> have to stick with that. Uh, it is, yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, there are days when I just think, oh, I'd love to start a new short story, you know? But I, I don't want to do that, I just want to plow yeah, through and, and get the work done, yeah. But I'm really, really looking forward, after this novel, to getting back to short stories and working towards a new collection. Okay, so you've got the, the hunger again. Yeah, definitely, yeah, that, that never goes away, yeah. Good. Okay, I wonder, Sean, would you get yeah. reading that? I'm reading from this story, it's called Hallian. Uh, it's a story in two bits. Hallian is a word that um, sort of, you know, my granny would have used if you were being a bit bad or you'd done something wrong. You'd, you know, you'd nicked a wee bit of money or some grand about some fags or something like that. Um, you know, you're a wee scamp, you're a wee gurrier. So that's what Hallian means. It's not on serious, you haven't, you haven't killed anybody or anything. Um, one other thing, if I do that, it's because some of the text is being redacted. Um, the publisher, Declan Mead, who's here, had a visit uh, from a couple of strange men, and was told to remove some of the text. I swear to God, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> ah, 
If the army were spying down on us from the wax tower on the walls, the scum would have thought I was one of the jippos going door to door with a swanky red pram, the long range binoculars zooming in to check what's under the hood. Oi, Lionel, flip a neck, mate. One of the paddies is trying to flog a nipper in a stolen pram. All afternoon in this sleep too, how many doors in the brandy well did we knock on and no joy, even though I had the money right there in my hand? Will you mind the wee man for me for a couple of hours? It's an emergency. You'd think people were afraid of money around our way. Mrs. Hughes going, I'm expecting an important visitor and the coffin lid leading against the hall wall. Mrs. Walters going, I only do wee girls now, only the blonde ones. Or shy Leonie O'Brien with the bow in her hair smiling at you through the gap in the sandbags until her dad appeared and we had to make ourselves scarce off the lecky road. Catch that R.A.T. for me and I'll keep an eye on him for nothing, Mrs. O'Connell says, and holds out the brush pole with the sharpened edge. Spear or no spear, that's one thing about your dad. He run a mile from even a mention of that word. My own dad bit the head off one and threw it into the middle of us wains in the bed. He did. Last one out gets to stay off school, he said. I still have to check onto the covers at night before I get in. It drives your mother round the bend. Stop back in the corny weakling and lie down beside your shivering wife, she tells me. She'll have a field day to herself with new names for your dad when she finds out I have you out here in the good pram up a back lane at night too. And this fog now around the bins like it wants a head on a plate. So where's those two slops of sisters of yours and that communist you tricked into marrying you? Mrs. Match writes down in her notepad and shows it to me. You see her around the town handing out messages to people. Some of them are right, one say. I wrote back the truth that your mother's stuck in the sitting in the council offices and your two aunties won't speak to me because of what I have coming to me tonight. And my ma, your poor granny, still in the hospital, but she can't read my handwriting. And she tears it out and burns it and wants me to write it again. And my hand starts to shake like I'm back at school. Your dad never did great at school, either, Neil. That's your mother's territory, up and down the road to Belfast to the university. Always a book in her hand, whether she's warming her bottle or cleaning her big teeth. So let one fly at you too, if you know him. A book on the nut, you'll feel, if you get her good. Thought that was him there arriving, the man with the bazooka. Well, Henry called from Pilot's Row. And he's bound to keep us waiting too to make himself feel big. Nearly half seven it is now. We'll, ha we'll hear him first with his bicycle bell. He rings in his pocket thinking it's scary. <coughs> Here I come, ready or not, drink, drink. A bottle of vodka in the other pocket. And the sweaty bald red head your mother says would put you off your dinner. Mind that woman we kept seeing everywhere earlier with the ladders? on her shoulder, and I didn't want to talk to her. That's his wife. She does the windows. I can tell you a story or two about ladders. You see, she takes a shine to you. Once I've moved across the border to avoid her. She can't help it though. But my hair's not always cracked up to me. Not anymore anyway. He's slipping. They'll have to replace him soon. In the past few months, there's three kneecaps he's managed to make a balls off. Look what happened to me right here, in this exact same spot, only a fortnight ago, right over there in the corner, where Camel, it must be, has written, we know too much. Camel is off his head. It was a nicer night than this, none of this fog. Well, here turns up half an hour late, and he's in, the, he's in bad form because he's a toothache, and he's necking a vodka, which makes me even more nervous that it'll affect his aim. You have to do it properly, or your dad won't be kicking a ball around with you, or badminton, which is my favourite game, did you know that? Badminton on the beach in the sun, that's the way it should be, every day. Well, Helen can barely talk with a pain, and he's pointing a gun at me to lie down over there by the corner. We're still waiting for somebody else to turn up with the bullets and hold me down too. That's the way they do it, keep the bullets separate, so if you're caught with a gun, it's unloaded, which isn't so bad. Hold on, I'm telling Mother Heron, I'm trying to take off my jeans. They're the only ones I've left, and I don't want a big hole in them or blood either. What the hell have you got, come out of it, I say to him. He's staring at me like I'm a brand new perfect bike for his bell. Then he's a light around, and he's kneeling down in front of me, and starts inspecting my skinny white legs in the flame. It was right over there. 
Your mother hates my legs. Girly legs, she calls them. Come with them up before I heal, she says. But my hair must think they're nice because you see that crooked yellow back gate? He's banging his head off it and the butt of the gun and whinging, I can't hurt those fine alabaster legs. I can't hurt those fine alabaster legs. Alabaster, Neil. I was checking for it in your ma's dictionary. I took it into the toilet with me, but she caught me on the way out and thought I was looking up dirty words. And that got her da another clout on a night on the sofa. Now, I don't you be telling anybody. That's a secret between you and your da. I didn't mean to lie to your mother about it. Mind how happy she was when I came back and told her I had a reprieve. You and her were round to your other grannies. The cotton jam I told her and they can't hang me twice. I really thought I was off the hook. Mind how delighted she was. It's all over, she thought. When she's happy like that, who cares about anything? We got fish and chips on the way home and she told us about when she was a girl and broke her ankle up Mount Ariel. Only Mulhern, to save his own neck, went and told the boys I had to shoot up, the sneaky F-U-C-K-E-R. And they believed him, and not your da. And they commanded I turn up again, or else. So here we are, the Quins, father and son, two legs and four wheels, and a stretcher with my name on it. I didn't have the heart to tell your mother, Neil. I tried a few times, but I never felt right to upset her again. Hasn't she been in great form the last few days? Passed her exams and talking about a holiday? Just take me anywhere. I don't care, she was saying. Nobody could have told her. Look how she reacted when she found out the first time. You were there kicking your legs on the sofa and your mom was reading at the table with her curlers in and the doorbell goes. I went to answer it and four hours later I came back. Who are you, she says. Who the hell are you, just a drip of a man. Five days she wouldn't let me back in the flat. And his name is not Neil, she's shouting after me down the street and holding me way up in the air with her two hands. His name's not Neil anymore. Your father was a thief and a hood and you're another bloody thieving alien. Shouting it all over him, shouting it all after me on the street. Sorry about leaving you with Mrs. Craven. I was out of options, son. Run a few messages for me and I'll think about it, she roars at me, the deaf bat. Over to the barber's, the bag of her famous mothballs, and pick her up some soup powder and a bar of turkey's delight from the people's shop on the way back. Fair enough, I thought. You could choke with the smell of chemicals in her hall, but I was getting desperate, and the sleep was worse than it was dark nearly. You'd be dry and warm and have a rusk, and no need to see your dad rolling around in the muck. The barber's on Nelson Street, and then a shop, and back, wee buns. I shouldn't have believed it. Some days are not like other days, son. Some days, nothing happens, and you think it's because the people are nervous. People are quiet. The clock seems slow. People wonder what might happen. Other days, they're greedy as hell. We were trapped in there in Vinnie's big time barbershop, about a hundred of us, a hundred and fifty maybe. We had to bloody dig our way out through the old tunnel. That's why my hands are so stiff I can't undo the button of my jeans. Well, Helen will have to do it for me, and I'm not joking you. Straight away in the door of Vinnie's, I met my dad's brother, Boo, and I have to stop and talk to him, and right beside him, Sinclair, the journalist, and then I have to talk to Kearney and Don and then Moloch and Henri and Camel and Buckle and loads of them, and... <laughs> and all the time as things dropping on your head, worse than sleet, tons of moths and the smell of their burning wings and the lights blinking in the smoke, I have a delivery for Vinny, I kept telling them, but you have to stop and join in, or once take it thick. I have a delivery for Vinny. It must have taken me about an hour to make it through the faces to the other side of the shop, where Vinny's trying to hypnotize this wee lad in the chair, 10, maybe 11, with long blonde hair like a girl's down to the floor, two men holding them down, and he's screaming away and choking with the moths, probably stuck right down inside his throat, and Vinny swinging his special red stone on a lace, and roaring at him, you're feeling sleepy, you're feeling sleepy. You've some nerve coming in here, he eventually says to me. Our Iris is weeping a river. That's his daughter Iris, he means. I didn't touch her, I said. He carries on blanking me for about another half an hour. You see, I saw Iris in the people's shop on the way over. She took one look at me and started weeping because probably I remind her of Faze. Your godfather, Faze. 
Where is Faze? She grabs hold of me. Tell me where Faze is. The tears soaking the free cheese. I didn't know where Faze was. Your mother made me swear I wouldn't have anything more to do with him after we got caught again. And I stuck to it too, didn't I? Avoiding places, staying in at the weekends. But he was waiting for me one day outside the brew. I have a gun, he says. I got us a pistol. There's this chemist in Glen Owen with a new safe. He had it all worked out. One last dance, he said, doing one of his tricky shuffles in his new white boots. When he's in that state, he's a hard man to refuse. He spins you round. You say no, and you may as well have punched him in the guts out of the blue with a shot on his face. Disbelief. That's just how it happened. Faze in his white boots and the hair slicked back. And the very next day, we did it. I always had a weakness for your mother from the first time I saw her, waving a flag in the barricade. Hair flying in the wind like she was falling, and the big teeth. But I never had the balls to talk to her. We don't need the noose, Faze shouts at me out the back of the chemist. Why did you bring the noose, you moron? Call me that again, I'll hang you myself, I said. I should have walked away there and then and told him to shove his excuse for a gun. It was only half a gun he had, the top bit only, just the bottom of handle or trigger. Faze had it cell taped along his finger. And we didn't need it anyway because the, the noose scares people more. Drag a chair into the middle of the room and shoot him the rope and it'll give you the combination to heaven. The chemist man nearly fainted. We were in no time, scot free. And we thought we got away with it until that knock on the door, you kicking your legs on the sofa and your man reading one of her books. Drain, drain. I hear it before I open it. And Mulhern says, get in the car pronto. A cortina of state. Then I see Faze in the back seat in his pajamas. I know. We're for it. No way out. We're screwed, son. Leave town or take your oil. That's the deal. We already had our last warning after we were squealed on over those magazines from the house in Brian. Faith couldn't keep them to himself. Wanted to show them to people. A big box of stupid bloody blue magazines. That was his fault. Someone grasped us up. But how were we to know there was a man lying under the floorboards in the chemists? A man on the run, hiding under the floorboards who saw the whole thing, up through the cracks in the floor after we took off our scarves. And where is he now? How shall I blow, do you know? Liverpool? Coventry? What do they call it? Holland? Faze blew the roost. Poor Iris in the people's shop. Won't believe me though. She obviously doesn't know Faze too well if she thinks he'd stick around for a pair of crutches. Not Faze. He'd be more worried about what to wear with him than the bullets. Whether he should get his good shoes on, what suit. Might have made a christening dancing with every woman there. Some mover. And dancing with your mother too, who never cast a shadow on the dance floor. Three songs she danced with him, and those two were never supposed to get on. A fire in a bin, she calls him. I only got the one at her own bloody wedding, sir. Sure. But Faith is your godfather, don't you ever forget that, however many hearts he breaks, or what people say about him. You think Iris was the first the way she was crying? Take that poor girl home, for God's sake, the women were saying. Nobody can stick seeing that type of crying for long. I felt bad for her, so we got her coat and I gave, her, and I gave the invisible man his fags at the door. You see, that's why I went into the shop in the first place. The invisible man was outside as I was passing, and he asked me to buy them for him, and I know my favourites or already say no. He's barred from everywhere, so he is. He winds people up the wrong way, standing around listening, in on their conversations, and following them around, claiming he's invisible. Your man says he's a cod artist, but he may as well be invisible now. I tend to believe him. You have to believe people at some stage. That's what I say. No matter what line they're spinning you, you have to believe people, Neil. There's no other way. But poor Iris, mind the day she had you in her lap and you wouldn't let go of her million curls and her pointy eyebrows. Two birds in flight, your mother calls her. If she'd seen the way I had to practically carry her up the steps of the high flats, and her sobs echoing so much, it was like a choir of dying angels, I'd never live it down. I'm too soft, according to your mother, I'll walk over her. But I believed her, she was upset. It wasn't her fault. And then hey presto, she slips out of my arm and runs for the fourth floor landing and throws her leg over. What's she doing in there, wondering? What the hell is she up to? Only her long denim coat gets caught in the railings, or she would have went right over. That's heartbreak for you. May it never know your name, Neil. She would do anything to make it stop. 
But she's tangled up on her coat on the railing, so she looks at me. And you know what she says? Like it might even have been her last words. How can anyone be such a crit? And me, it'd be nice to her. Why the hell is everyone calling me stupid these days? After, that's what I was thinking. And so out of spite, I ran over and grabbed her and started pulling her back onto the veranda and shouting for help. Help! Somebody help me! Down in the courtyard, there's one of those foreign visitors giving a speech to the crowd. Don't give up the struggle against the imperialists. The people united will never be defeated. And the crowd cheering so nobody can hear what's happening on the fourth floor. And Iris is scratching the face off me with her nails, which her mother will be more annoyed about than the holes in my knees and having to bring me breakfast in bed for a while. And you know what else? Well, Heron is just going to have to look after you if they don't let me take you in the ambulance with me. Strange thing happened next to them. Three wee boys appear, and they've all got broken arms. Five broken arms in plaster between them. They come out of one of the empty flats. Three wee mummies on the fourth floor landing. At least, I would never treat you like that. Experiment on you with plaster the way their father does. He was there too. The bath full of plastery pouch inside, and arms and legs lying about the place. These white shells, crusts of arms and legs, piled up in the corner. I nearly have the mixture right, he tells me, staring into the bath. One of the small ones from the wells. For the plaster to set right, he means. Then he was taking the wings down to the brew and making a claim against the government for injuries. Everybody would be doing it once he had perfected the mixture, he promised me. The entire town staggering around a plaster of Paris and seeing the pretty stick. Break the bank, he was saying. That's all I listen to, a nation of shopkeepers remember. Iris was there too now, like nothing had ever happened. The tears probably still hadn't hit the ground below yet. And she orders me to give the wings a Turkish delight to cheer them up. I tell you, I was so fed up at this point, I nearly went back and got you from Mrs. Craven and not showed up here at all. Blew down over the border and live in a caravan. Play badminton on the beach. Live on candy floss and milk from the cows in the fields. But they call me a coward, and that's not what I am. Your dad's no coward, Neil. They can run me down all they want, but I'm not a coward or a dope, right? I know what's going on. Your dad's his eyes open. 28 now. I'm no grass either. But you see if Mulherrin doesn't show his bait very soon, you and me are waltzing round to the house of you know who and spilling the beans that he's been at. <laughs> I, was always a bit, I was always a bit scared of your mother, to be honest. And a whole lot of them, the McGarrigans. Her crew were always political. I think your mother only ever noticed my existence after my dad bit the face of that are you see man. Your granddad would take anybody on. It didn't matter how many. No law could hold them. One of you slaves to the scumbag queen is not leaving here unchanged, he was shouting at the top of the stairs when they kicked down the door. One of you will be altered. This is the house of Lockjaw Quinn. And he pointed at the biggest of them and locked on with his teeth. They must have broken every bone in his body, but they couldn't get him off. The two of them were taken away, still stuck together. And that was the first time your mother spoke to me outside in the street afterwards. A riot started. I was sitting on the window ledge and thinking, thinking. And she must have seen it. So she squeezed in beside me, took off her real balaclava, lit up two fags in her mouth at the same time, and gave me one. And you know what she said? Don't be a dope, Ricardo. My name's Richard, I said. And she said, don't do what they want you to do. Who? I said. Them and you, it's the same thing, she said. And I suddenly understood what she meant. Them and you, it's the same thing. You remember that too, Neil, because there's always somebody more than glad to order you about. Three wee mummies on the fourth floor veranda, as if that wasn't enough, as if I had more to, more to learn today. I'd say by the point I left the flats, Mrs. Craven had already taken you with her around to her daughters, who bakes the cakes in any shape you want. You've got a nice bit of meringue to suck on, I hear. The funny thing is, I saw Oodles, her husband, on the way to the barbers. Mrs. Craven's son-in-law, I mean. And guess who had him pinned up against the wall? Only ladders. 
He's shouting over to me and waving like he's a drowning man. Show her your legs. Show her your legs. How the hell did you know about my legs, I wonder? But I do it anyway, because I believed him on the spot. Pulled up my trousers, and when Ladders is distracted, he makes a run for it, and I pile into the barbers, into the jungle. It was like a jungle must be, with the moss flying about in the smoke, and the steam, and infestation, it's called. And their bodies cracking open under your feet among the butts, and 40 different arguments going on, and Ladders at the window with her sponge and bucket. You are feeling sleepy. You are feeling sleepy. few major exceptions, there has been, it seems to me, there has been relatively little engagement with the kind of, uh, this, the, the legacy of sectarianism and violence and the troubles in the North in contemporary Irish fiction, uh, North and South, and it's such rich material as you've just amply demonstrated. Would you agree? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, I'd say people aren't publishing it. There's plenty around, you're told not to write about it. And yeah, you know, most people in, in the south claim they're not interested in it. Do, do you mean writers who you know from the north? Yeah, there's um, there's plenty of work that's been you know every writer coming out of the north has got to you know uh, face that material in some way or form. Uh, but you know there hasn't been much of an appetite for it. Yeah, yeah. What, why do you think that is? Guilt on the part of us. So yes, I definitely do think that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You walked away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a meter. Personal. <laughs> um, it's your fault. I know. And <laughs> um, we're running out of time, so I want to show you. creative writing. Um, I would just say read as much as you possibly can, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's the best training you can do for writing and read and reread and absorb the, the styles of, of the people that you have read and the people that you like, you know. Um, it's n I'm not saying imitating the styles at all. Although one story that I generally tell my creative writing classes, which I found rather interesting, um, it was Joe O'Connor prefaced um, one of the Hennessy anthologies by saying the best story I ever wrote was a John McGarren story and he said I don't mean it was like a John McGarren story it was a John McGarren story and uh, he went on to explain that what he had done was he'd read this John McGarren story thought that it was so brilliant and started sort of looking at the techniques and everything he started to rewrite it so he changed each sentence one by one and he said when he came to the end of it it was a completely original story so I thought that was rather interesting. But yeah, just read everything you can get your hands on. Sure. Change your name. <laughs> you're, 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 the, you're your own worst obstacle. Pretend someone else is right, not you. Okay, I think there was another hand. Was it at the back? My question's for Sean. Um, my dad, when I'm finding the hair to write, she says, um, I this fella and he could go ahead to me and tell these stories and just write it down, it's scratch. Um, and I thought he was slagging me off. But um, since we remark earlier, I'm just wondering, can I go to your class? <laughs> <laughs> that, that story there actually um, does come um, from, uh, from Man Dairy, most of it, yeah. It's the way they tell the stories, you know, it's, you know you're, you're trying to entertain as well. and. Um, I mean, these stories are, are set in a, in a period that, that, that's, that's silent and, lo and lost, you know, uh, the, the early 70s, so uh, those people are starting to die off. So, you know, get to them and get whatever you can, particularly the lies. That's 
what you want. Okay, maybe we have one more question. Maybe. No, maybe with that then we we'll finish. So okay, thanks again very much. There are two three.